Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Matt Bernico. And I'm your other co-host, Dean Dutloff. Dean, we're getting back to it this week. We've had a few weeks doing uh, more freewheeling conversations and just kind of vibing about things, and that's awesome. I love that. I love doing that. But this week, we're getting back on track with a book. We were reading a book this week. <laughs> book report uh, week. Yeah, it's, it's a book report episode. I feel like that's when we're bringing our most to this podcast is when we're reading a book <laughs> and telling somebody about it. And maybe that's not true, but that's just how I feel. Um, you might remember that back around Christmas, we talked about a book by Richard Horsley, The um, the Liberation of Christmas. Uh, it's pretty cool, a pretty cool um, explanation of the Christmas story against the backdrop of the political economy of the time. And we're going to dive back into some of that this week. Not Christmas stuff, though. Hang on. Pause. Definitely not Christmas stuff. <laughs> Christmas is over. I don't want to think about Christmas anymore. It's but we are Easter. going to... I know, that's right. We should be talking about Easter. But we're not even doing that. Uh, we're going to get back into the uh, conversations about like history and political economy and biblical studies with Richard Horsley um, in a book that he wrote called You Shall Not Bow Down and Serve Them. I really put the uh, emphasis on the you there, but (laughs) (laughs) it sounds like a Joel Osteen when you say it. (laughs) That's a good point. This book is very cool. I'm really excited to talk about it with you a bit, Dean, because there's a lot of interesting ideas in it. Uh, But the big idea behind this book is that if you read the Gospels with economics and imperialism in mind, you get a set of texts that have a surprising amount to say about resisting exploitation, but in like a really unique way. Jesus is like, has has some very interesting things to say about economic exploitation when you kind of understand that's what he's talking about. Uh, But it's not necessarily in the same way that somebody like Karl Marx or whatever (laughs) would would say it. (laughs) What this book does that is very cool is that it shows you some things that you definitely wouldn't normally notice about the Bible. Uh, because of, you know, just the difficulties of interpretation in general, and then also the difficulties of being 2000 plus years away from the culture that wrote the Gospels. Understanding the context of this whole big thing is really hard and difficult and just like over our heads. Like it is, it's not just that it's hard. It's like beyond our intellectual capacities, unless we have somebody like pointing it out to us. I'm really glad that Richard Horsley has done that (laughs) and pointed it out to us. uh, Because according to Horsley, we miss uh, we miss what the Gospels are all about when we try to read them like in a simple way or in an overly spiritual way or individualistic way. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is literally the opposite uh, advice that you're going to get from your evangelical pastor to just kind of sit down, open up the Bible and let it speak to you and uh, you'll get something back out of it. I mean, you can still do that. You will get something out of it for sure. But what Richard Horsley and lots of other biblical scholars show is that uh, you're going to get a lot more out of it if you actually know what's going on. And this book is also really fascinating because the the subtitle is The Political Economic Projects of Jesus and Paul. And there's this cool argument that they do actually have political economic projects. And you can only understand those if you get the political economy that they're engaging and critically engaging and trying to think of alternatives to. And that's really neat. It's also a more recent book. It was published in 2021. And it's a cool kind of um, piece by somebody who's obviously been thinking about the Bible for a really long time. Uh, He's written a ton of other interesting books that I'm sure we'll have to talk about later on the podcast. Um, He has a book that is really fascinating about like bandits and the biblical story and kind of other sorts of rabble-rousing characters. So just a guy who's looking at the Bible in some pretty unique ways. But what's great about this text is that he is trying to kind of I guess, convince people reading the Bible, but also biblical scholars that knowing something about economics is actually really important if you want to understand the the people who are important in the text. Um, he also has some great criticisms of biblical scholarship that we'll talk about in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, lots of also kind of criticisms of reading the Bible outside of uh, uh, an awareness of our own kind of geopolitical times and what we're reading into it or not reading into it. Uh, so lots on offer in a book like this, but it's a great uh, a great way to get into the, the political economy of the Bible. And the book covers quite a lot of ground. So we're going to split it in half. We're going to talk about Jesus this week and Paul next week. And maybe too that week will give us a little uh, chance to figure out if there are any other interesting differences between those two characters, their political economic programs. But uh, great to have Horsley as a guide to sort it out. Yeah, totally. Um, a two-parter. What's not to love about that? Uh, but speaking of this parter, uh, by the end of this episode, 
hopefully you'll be able to, I don't know, have some kind of better understanding of the political economy of the Gospels. And that will at least, if nothing else, uh, give you some good ammo to annoy other Christians with. And that's really what it's all about in the end. Um, <laughs> maybe... <laughs> it's the goal of this podcast, really. Yeah, exactly. Maybe some new, uh, some new political insight, some new ideas about the Bible that you didn't have, but you will be more annoying to other people, and that's great. Uh, so, Dean, <laughs> let's just get right into it. The first step, I'm becoming a more annoying person and being a, a little bit more of a know-it-all when you go to Bible study. Horsley starts off the book with this, like, a critique, but also, like, an orientation that I think is a good one to keep in mind when we're looking at the Bible. So Horsley writes, Modern Western culture often separates religion from real life and reduces religion to individual faith. This narrowing of religion to the confines of individual faith has enabled a burgeoning capitalist economy that weakens social relations and responsibilities, hampers biblical regulations, and marginalizes religion to other motivations and concerns. The books of the Bible are about all of life, and that biblical teachings contain more about politics and economics than about religion to the narrow modern understanding of this term. <laughs> you said it hampers biblical regulations, um, but the text is that it hampers political regulations, but I like I like the way you read it. Um, it also hampers biblical regulations. Both of them. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some good orientation, though. I, I like the uh, the phrase that the Bible is about all of life. Um, I think that's actually really cool. It's about all of life and not just like the spiritual parts of life, which is maybe a different approach to then, you know, what you might get if you go to church or whatever. Um, it's, you know, primarily a book about uh, salvation or something, or even like the evangelical invocation of uh, this is a book that's like the instruction manual for life is you know, like a weird statement that means not all of life, but it means just like how to become saved or something, right? <laughs> but this is saying that the, the Bible is about all of life, that religion is about all of life, not just like one thing or the other. It's it's all of it kind of put together. I, I think a, a helpful idea to kind of get started when you're reading something in the Bible. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of literature even in religious studies about how the term religion kind of cordons off our our world or like cuts up our world in these really weird ways. Like what's religious and what's not religious? What, uh, what things do we kind of privatize and what things do we publicize? When is religion allowed to come into public? When is it kind of better off left at home or, you know, behind closed doors? And what Horsley is doing, I think, is something really interesting by saying if you have that category of religion, it's actually going to make it really difficult to understand what's going on in the Bible, because that's not the the kind of world that you're entering into when you read a text like that. Um, for example, in the prophets in the Old Testament, you hear a lot about pastoral stuff like fields and households. And if you're a modern person, the significance of that might kind of fly under the radar completely or just feels like alienated, especially when you don't live in an agrarian economy. Or it could feel, too, like maybe he's talking about uh, or maybe the Bible is talking about kind of secular affairs in a religious book. But Horsley explains that the prophets are concerned about fields and households because those are the, the basic building blocks of subsistence for people. And the stability of communities that you hear about in the Old Testament, they hinge on those fields and households. So when you hear passages in Amos or Isaiah talking about the wicked who covet and steal pastoral things, you're also hearing stories about the economic rights of people in the ancient world. And those are bound together in the kind of prophetic voice or the voice that's calling the people back to God. So I think uh, it's a, a cool observation that Horsley makes that we have to rethink the categories in which we've been kind of shaped to live our lives if we want to get into uh, how the Bible's talking about something like justice or, you know, these other so-called kind of secular or even so-called religious concerns. Yeah, totally. Uh, when I read that bit from Horsley, I was thinking a lot about the German ideology that, like, you know, history is primarily about how you eat or how you make something. And, like, that's exactly what Horsley is saying here in the Bible It's like, that's what that's what Isaiah, that's what Amos, that's what all these other like Old Testament prophets are concerned about. How are people eating? And it is such a weird weird thing because you um, man, there's this phrase that gets thrown around a lot in the Old Testament, the the phrase inheritance, and exactly like what that means to me is something very different than what it means, you know, in this like particular paradigm. Um, Horsley has this whole thing in there about how, you know, inheritance is a big deal because it's not just about like passing down money or something. It's like, that's, that's like about the stability of an entire community of people, you know, not just like the person who is like receiving the inheritance, but also all the people that work on the land and the people who like 
uh, you know, benefit by getting produce from that land. So like, uh, these, these things are, are about fundamental, like economic building blocks of society. Um, but Christians especially love to like, I don't know, spiritualize them in weird and unhelpful ways. <laughs> Also, one funny kind of irony about that specific term is a lot of capitalists today will talk about inheritance in those kind of ways that like, okay, they might receive this big lump sum or like they might receive some controlling shares of a company or whatever when they're, you know, like big economic uh, parent dies or something. But they uh, so they'll they'll make this argument about how like they're a crucial part of the economy because, uh, you know, their inheritance or the company that their parents built or whatever, they went on to employ all these people, they're job creators, they inject money into the economy, etc. cetera. Uh, so you could kind of walk away with the wrong impression that these are the same kinds of things, that there's a, an assumption that an inheritance is also a, a social good, not just an individual one. But uh, the important thing that Horsley points out, too, is that our capitalist economy today is actually really different from the kind of agrarian economy that you have in the past. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is um, when when someone tells you that their inheritance is like also building up the common good in a capitalist economy, when you when you do go to the Bible study and you are an annoying Christian and the rich person in your Bible study says that they are also doing the same thing, you can tell them, no, you're not, because capitalism is a completely different set of uh, economic relations. And the, the key that Horsley is always coming back to is that these kinds of peasant agrarian societies in both the Old and New Testament are actually like both really like thickly coherent, like people kind of, you know, they like bind together in these complicated ways. And they're also very precarious and fragile because mm -hmm. like if the key pieces of those bindings fall out, then you're essentially screwed. So there, there's a really interesting kind of emphasis on the specificity of those economies as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point, that they're different, specific. Um, yeah, when you hear the word inheritance, it is not the same meaning as Amos means it or something, right? It's completely different. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so the Bible is, is full of these types of distinctions um, about uh, justice and the way that it thinks about justice. Like, um, you know, like in Isaiah and Amos, right, there's like, there's a, a real prophetic feeling of like outrage always, you know, <laughs> like Amos is a great book to read, especially if you're a socialist, because it's all kinds of um, just stuff about being mad <laughs> about people um, getting one over <laughs> on, on the orphans and the widows and stuff. Um, but Horsley like recognizes uh, maybe not quite what you call taxonomy, but it is, I mean, it's kind of tax taxonomic taxonomic oh my god i can't even <laughs> it is a bit like one um he has these uh, a few different categories for types of injustice or like orientations towards economic injustice in the bible so you have things like what he calls radical insistence on economic justice like what you get in amos and isaiah and other prophets you know that like outrage that feeling of like these people are taking things that de that belong to another community that that kind of thing but then you also get other types of stances towards economic injustice that are like reformist um i'm, I'm using the the quotation mark fingers here because again the word reformist <laughs> has like a lot of different connotations especially from like a from a podcast that talks about Karl marx very often but it's not like that <laughs> <laughs> a different sort of feel of of reformist here um but uh in in horsley's case a reformist stance towards injustice is uh about the you know like the the moment where the direct rule of mosaic law is replaced by a king who's supposed to observe mosaic law but like don't <laughs> so um he talks of, of, about like the first and second samuel which by the way um the uh that's that's just the bit that the uh, the podcast Bible reading group has just gotten through so I'm feeling pretty confident about <laughs> about how <laughs> how bad um the, the king about how bad David is in particular as a king <laughs> not a lot going on for him honestly um so anyways there's there's this uh, that's the reformist stance where there's like you know there was this sort of like um direct this direct rule of sort of like the mosaic covenant or like mosaic law or whatever, but then there's like this reform where now there's actually a king who's kind of going to mediate some of that stuff that that's going on there. And then a after that, you get something that's even more uncomfortable, <laughs> what Horsley calls the divine blessing on institutionalized injustice. And by that, he means like the institutionalized just injustice that like a lot of kings bring to Israel. I mean, David's usually the example of the good king, 
Um, which, <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe in comparison to some of the others, that's fair. But for example, Horsley mentions the like unconditional promise to David's dynasty as being an example of this. The the other kings are often going to put the people of Israel like uh, he, he's going to put their economic rights, if maybe that's not the right term, but their economic well being into question because of you know this particular. A uh, promise that God makes to David or something. So there, there's that type of injustice um, or that way of thinking about injustice where there's um, God's involved in this kind of yucky way. But then there's also a, a, a bit more like um, big picture structural types of injustice that you hear about in the Bible. And, and these come m- into play mostly in the New Testament, but some, some places elsewhere too. Um, but in the New Testament, they always have to do with the imperial order uh, of Rome on Judea and Galilee. And the imperial order is like the backdrop of all of the gospels. It's the backdrop of the Christmas story, if you'll remember that part of Horsley. Um, so in it, you get things like, you know, Roman rule from afar, imperial relationships with client rulers, intensive taxation, lots of religious tensions because of, um, you know, the particular religious nature of Roman imperialism and also the, the ways that might rub up against the Jewish way of life at the time. So um, there's all of that. And then finally, Horsley has the last kind of piece of the taxonomy is the condemnation of imperial structures of injustice. And that is like the what, what he sees is at the heart of the Gospels. That's like what Jesus is always doing. Um, everything that, <laughs> I mean, basically everything that Jesus says, it has like actually a lot of economic import uh, when it comes to like village life and what it means to be a person rejecting like imperial rule. So we'll, we'll get to all of that in a minute, but uh, there's this kind of nice taxonomy. I think it's it's actually helpful for maybe understanding some of the big movements and, and ways that the Bible talks about injustice because I mean, it, t- it talks about it in all kinds of different ways, but having these sort of like big paradigm moments are helpful to maybe organize your thoughts. Uh, there's probably ways that these are not exactly true or maybe rub up against each other in, in ways, but I, I feel like this is at least a productive way to start categorizing some of these things. Yeah, it's always helpful when somebody pulls uh, some distinctions out of a text like uh, like the Bible for sure. Um, I mean, we've identified like five or so different ones, I guess. But uh, what I think is really helpful about Horsley is he's also kind of expressing the plurality that's present in the Bible, that there's not really like one, like obviously singular strand of continuity without any contradiction uh, that kind of goes from Genesis to Revelation. But instead, there's kind of a chorus of different voices And in different parts of the Bible, you hear some of the voices in that chorus a little more loudly than others, for sure. And by the time you get to the New Testament for Horsley, Jesus is really intervening in that kind of, uh, you know, that that whole situation, that big conversation. Um, He's making a contribution. He's kind of pulling on certain threads, playing some up, and ultimately uh, turns out to be a very savvy kind of uh, observer of the economic situation of his time, and also somebody who's thinking really creatively about how to lean into what is actually the strongest parts of the the kind of peasant economy that he finds himself in, which I think is really unique. Um, I mean, I feel like there's often that kind of analogous conversation in other parts of biblical studies. Like people will say that with respect to ideas of divine violence, that maybe there's this kind of plurality of voices in the Bible about whether or not God is really violent or should be violent, and then Jesus kind of comes and gives you the the full picture or whatever. Um, but uh, and I think that like some of those are <laughs> stronger arguments than others. <laughs> but Horsley's is actually really uh, quite interesting that there's an, actually an economic plurality in the Bible too. That there's a a big kind of set of different attitudes toward economic justice, and Jesus is going to give his his take, and eventually Paul as well. Um, but that idea that, uh, that again, Jesus is kind of intervening, I think is really helpful. Yeah, totally. Very helpful. So in the first three chapters of the book, Horsley gives a lot of like great background about the political economy of uh, the New Testament. And there's a lot of information in there about how the imperial system works and like um, which client rulers are doing what and all kinds of stuff. Um and I feel like that could be a whole conversation in and of itself. Uh, but I think that the like the teeth to some of those observations really come through in the fourth chapter. 
uh, which is called the, the Political Economic Project of Jesus's Mission and Movements. And in this section, you get some of these like sort of dialed in moments in the gospel where Jesus is saying something and we will often interpret it in X, Y, and Z ways, whether it's like a spiritual way or maybe in a social justice kind of way or whatever. And Horsley will take it and put it into context um, and like, and, and tell us like what it might mean in the context of the peasant village political economy of like Judea, of Galilee, of some of these other sort of like Roman client states. Um, and then also what it means specifically with like Jesus's like sort of position as like a, a Jewish person in those times, right? And like what he's saying to these other communities um, and, and how what Jesus is saying like might relate to things like the Mosaic Law <laughs> or, or whatever. So um, I think that this part kind of gets to some of like the big ideas about like how exactly this type of analysis is helpful and like what it does for us. So this is not like, man, this is not the summation of everything that he says. Obviously, the, the book is quite big and uh, there's a lot to it. But this is maybe at least a good place to start. Does that sound OK, Dean? Sounds great. OK, great. Um, if there's any pieces I miss <laughs> about imperialism and in, in the whole way, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get everyone. <laughs> yeah, totally. So Horsley starts off the section saying that recent interpretation of Jesus focus on separate sayings remains limited by its modern individualism and separation of religion from political economy. This is the same thing that we're kind of talking about earlier, that uh, that religion is about all of life. The Bible is talking about all of life, not just like, you know, going to church on Sunday or one weird paradigm of um I don't know, Protestant theology. So anyways, recent interpretations of Jesus focused on separate sayings remains limited by its modern individualism and separation of religion from political economy. The gospel as whole stories, however, presents a dramatically different picture portraying Jesus in interaction with fundamental socioeconomic forms. So Horsley makes a few, I think, helpful points about this from the start. Jesus' mission is focused on village communities in or in like agrarian settings. So that's like the backdrop. I mean, Jesus goes into bigger cities, bigger towns, and so on as well. That's all part of the story too. But like um, when he's uh, going to um, teach people or like heal them or do an exorcism, he's going to a small village. He's going to a place of like, you know, a handful of families that have lived in that region for who knows how long. They're grouped together and they're all like reliant on one another uh, to survive, especially given the like increasing economic precarity uh, of the, you know, Roman imperialist sort of situation. So Horsley says that the gospel stories, moreover, have Jesus going to synagogues of Capernaum and other villages on the Sabbath. Contrary to the standard but anachronistic assumption, synagogue in the gospel refers not to religious buildings, but to village assemblies, the form of local self-governance and community coercion gathered at least once a week. I thought this was helpful because it does kind of set the scene even a bit further that Jesus is going to the synagogue um, in in this like um, slightly different, I guess, background. Uh, Horsley kind of goes out of his way to point that synagogue is a, a word that um, in, in this context at least can just mean gathering, right? It's about like the assembly. It's the... Um, it's like, it's it's the town hall every Sunday, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, this is a, a helpful background that, that these stories that, you know, you've grown up hearing in church that have layers and layers of meaning to them. They happened in villages. They happened in these agrarian settings. They're not big cities. And they happened in these, like, communal gatherings where, like, the these, these places are coming together to, you know, address a certain situation. Yeah, and I think not only is that helpful for like an average reader maybe trying to enter into the the political realities that Jesus is engaging, but Horsley clearly also kind of has it out for other biblical interpreters or biblical scholars, including liberal scholars. Um, and maybe it's worth even setting that up a little bit here as well. Um, so you mentioned, you know, he talks about these recent interpretations of, uh, of Jesus focused on separate sayings, um, which is a, a kind of slight, a direct slight, not a kind of slight, <laughs> a direct slight against like the historical Jesus kind of Jesus seminar types who uh, did exactly that, kind of tried to determine which sayings of Jesus seem most likely to be historical, which ones are maybe a little more hagiographical or mythical or whatever, um, and uh, trying to kind of isolate and and pull out, you know, what's the historical Jesus from the 
I don't know, spiritual version of him or traditional version. And what is really fascinating about Horsley is that he has a criticism of that project as being kind of fundamentally tied to liberal concerns, but also liberal, um, I guess, like philosophical ways of cutting up the world. So, for example, in separating the economic out from the rest of society in the same way that we separate religion out from the rest of society. And for Horsley, you have to see these things all kind of as a whole when you encounter the Gospels. Um, there's a actually pretty funny, like, maybe I should just read it, uh, a very funny footnote where he's complaining about John Dominic Crossan specifically, who, uh, I don't know, if you're a person who's interested in biblical scholarship, you'll probably know about him. He's kind of like a popular writer about... Um, uh, the historical Jesus. And I mean, as far as like writers about Jesus go, he's not, not the worst. You could do a lot worse, but, uh, anyway, this is what Horsley has to say about him. So he says, uh, two constructions of Jesus that became particularly prominent over a century ago and emerged again to prominence at the end of the 20th century, both exemplify the reduction of Jesus to an individual figure. The one presented Jesus as a wisdom teacher of an individualistic discipleship of piety and ethics in withdrawal from the world of political economic affairs. The other presented Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet of the end of the world in cosmic catastrophe. Both of these lines of individualistic interpretation of Jesus are based primarily on the individual sayings of Jesus purposely isolated from their context, thus ignoring our primary guide to the historical political economic context, the gospel stories and speeches. Um, and then in this footnote, he says, uh, uh, Harnack's book, What is Christianity? and Crossan's Historical Jesus. Um, those are kind of the, the paradigms that he cites. Crossan's book, The Leading Voice of the Jesus Seminar, became highly influential, partly because it was aggressively marketed by the publisher, recently merged into the Murdoch Publishing Empire, which generated controversy by soliciting and marketing competing theological constructions of Jesus. Definitely a pretty, <laughs> I don't know, the kind of thing that you say if you're like a crabby old academic at the end of your career who's like really yeah. mad about other academics. Um, <laughs> so for sure, like a personal <laughs> thing going on here, I'm sure. But uh, I think there's also something to it that like, there's a bit of a cottage industry of people trying to figure out like the most controversial story about Jesus and then kind of having arguments among themselves that spill over into the church. And that's also like a pretty great marketing scheme scheme to like get a bunch of pastors riled up about the way that you think about, I don't know, the person of Jesus and, and so on. Um, any like undergraduate in a Bible studies program has uh, encountered exactly that phenomenon of people just getting worked up about like some specific historical reconstruction of Jesus. And I think what Horsley is right to say is that these are, I don't know, like not exactly um, the best ways of, of encountering the historical Jesus. I mean, I'm not a biblical scholar either, but I do feel convinced by his point that uh, unless you are really like committed to figuring out the detailed political economy of, of Jesus's time and how Jesus is, is interacting with that economy, you're inevitably going to kind of turn Jesus into the liberal Protestant that, you know, liberal Protestants want him to be. <laughs> and uh, Horsley's challenge is to say, if you're open to a more radical politic in the world and a more radical economics in the world, you might also find that Jesus is more radical as well. And, you know, there's a certain level at which we all kind of make Jesus into the person that we want him to be. Horsley's definitely doing that as well. Um, but I will say, I think that he's maybe like, this is confirmation bias, but I do think also he's kind of doing a better job at maybe challenging those uh, paradigms of liberalism in general, both with the kind of religious angle and the economic piece here. So I think it's just it's helpful to kind of have that in mind because Horsley's kind of grinding an axe here against his colleagues, but he's also trying to figure out why does it matter to see the synagogue, for example, as like a form of local self-governance and so on that Jesus is sort of disrupting in really weird ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's not only to like create another controversial Jesus, but also to like help us get into the mindset of like, why are these kind of gospel stories even important or why does the gospel go out of its way to like point out this, this parable or, or this particular scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Well, okay. First of all, we said, Great, good stuff. Great context to bring into all of this, and it is true that you, you know, will inevitably always make Jesus the person that you want Jesus to be, and that's a fair criticism. <laughs> I think of anybody kind of doing it, and something <laughs> always to kind of think about. And you know, that's true with Horsley. That's true with us for sure. But I think that there's something that Horsley does here that is quite interesting because, but Horsley gets, uh, I think, into 
into the context in such a way that gets us a little bit further and under and you know it gives it gives Jesus a different type of texture that's not just like the guy you want him to be, but also maybe a little bit something deeper as well. We'll we'll get mm-hmm. to it in a minute, maybe. So we have Jesus. We have him in villages. He's doing agrarian stuff. He's at the synagogue. It's great. <laughs> how how awesome! <laughs> Let's talk about what what some of that might mean. Um, Horsley makes a few other helpful points about like why the village is important in some of these stories, uh, especially about healing and exorcism. So Horsley says that Jesus's work in these villages is primarily twofold. First, he proclaims and teaches about the direct rule, the kingdom of God. The, the direct rule of God is like this phrase that Horsley will use throughout. And it does mean something really specific. It is not just like a cool anarchisty kind of thing to say. It means specifically <laughs> like that Jesus is a, is a figure that's constantly going to be calling people back towards the Mosaic covenant. Like specifically, that's what he's doing. Um, and I think that is uh, the importance of that cannot be um, ca- cannot be missed. It's a big deal. So that's what Jesus is doing. Um, that's what the kingdom of God is kind of like a, is, is pointing towards is is a, is a re exploration and renewal of the Mosaic covenant is is a big thing that Horsley is always telling us about. So he's doing that. That's the first thing. And then the second thing that Jesus is doing is that he's doing exorcisms and healings that manifest the direct rule of God. Uh, Horsley goes on to say that the healings and exorcisms are not simply individual interactions between Jesus and someone with a sickness or possessed by a spirit. Sickness and spirit possession affect whole villages, especially component households and families. Paralysis, blindness, and spirit possession all mean loss of labor essential to subsistence. Okay, this seems like a big deal to me because it's not something I would have ever thought about. Like whenever I've heard of, you know, the, the story about Jesus and like, and the demoniac or Jesus uh, curing the guy who's paralyzed. It's always just like, dang, sucks for that guy. <laughs> this is my thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a bummer that person's going through something. But um, putting it in that context is really helpful because, uh, you know, a village is just a grouping of families out there. You know, um, it's not it's not thousands of people. And when one person is laid up because they've got the devil inside them or whatever, right? <laughs> it's bad. It means that the whole the whole community is going to feel like a bit of like lurch in the uh, production of subsistence. Um, I, I think also maybe we can talk about the phrase even subsistence here for a minute too. That that's an important piece of the puzzle um, that we kind of take for granted in capitalism. But I mean that that's what these villages are are pushing for is subsistence production, right? They're not like capitalistic industries like dean mentioned earlier the context Mm -hmm. is quite different they're producing food so that they can eat the food that's what subsistence means they're not producing food so that they can sell it and buy the labor of workers to produce it or something right that's not what's (laughs) going on here it's it's a different whole scenario exactly and it's also uh kind of in between that as well like so the on the one hand you have the these villages based on peasant labor and kind of the the commune of the village there doing the subsistence labor. Uh, you also have a kind of creeping like proto-capitalist agenda to try to commodify that labor or increase the production of the land so that you can actually uh, sell a surplus or make peasants produce a surplus that goes not only to their own subsistence, but also to the particular local, you know, owner of that, of this vineyard or that, that plot or whatever. And I think that is also really fascinating that Jesus is also trying to like sort of help peasants um, that he's speaking with understand the importance of their own subsistence labor and how to kind of restore and maintain and kind of keep that that process going. Uh, There's a really interesting bit where he talks about households and families. Um, He says that households or families have an integral role in Jesus mission focused on village communities suggests Contrary to assertions of recent liberal interpreters that Jesus and the Gospels were not anti-family, households and families are presupposed and renewed in what seems to be a response to the disintegration of households and villages that was happening as a result of increased economic pressure. Jesus declares that those who do the will of God are his mothers and sisters and brothers. That is a renewed village community that can also serve as a supportive household or family, which had in effect been an aspect of covenantal mechanisms of mutual aid. Uh, I think this is really fascinating because uh, the bit you were even just talking about with uh, the people who are maybe like compelled by whatever reason to drop out of that subsistence reproduction. 
Um, you know, Jesus is restoring them back to their ability to to contribute to that local community. You also have this uh, kind of greater sense in which Jesus is expanding the idea of the village beyond just your biological family to be uh, a bigger kind of commune that whoever does the will of God is uh, is kind of building that, that commune together. And I think that is a pretty compelling vision. I think probably there's still something to be said about Jesus being anti-family. I'm thinking about like Hollis Phelps uh, did a great episode with us a while back about Jesus where he talked about that a bit. And I think what he says is pretty compelling, um, but not also different from what Horsley's saying, just maybe a, a difference in semantics or rhetoric. Uh, but the key being that uh, Jesus is trying to double down on what makes um, the reproduction of peasant life possible and important and also what makes it sort of resistant to predatory debt schemes and kind of lending issues that are happening uh, in the area. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, you know, whether or not Jesus is anti-family is like, it is a hermeneutic project and Horsley is engaged in like a particular type of hermeneutic project. And I think it's fine. And also I think that there's also, I mean, there, there's some good things to be said about Jesus's anti-family streak that you can have some fun with it, that um, you might get some good places. I mean, whatever, you know, <laughs> do, do, do what I, what you want with it. I'm just saying that there's, there's different ways to read this. Um, but this whole thing about like the, <laughs> yeah. like the resilience that the Jesus is kind of after like the resilience of communities, especially like in, in like peasant agriculture is really interesting. And Horsley has a few other points about that, that I think are kind of interesting that, um, that might challenge the way that we think about like what kind of guy Jesus is and like what he's after, but also gives like some logic to things that, um, are complicated. <laughs> like, uh, we were talking a minute ago, like, you know, you always kind of make Jesus in your own, in your own image or something, which is true and always a concern. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still saying it. Um, but Jesus is interested in the economic well-being of all these people, right? That's totally true. Um, but also there's a way that he is still like invested in like a patriarchal society that you just can't get around because that would just be true of somebody who lived during that particular time period, right? Like, to be to be pro family in this like agrarian sense is also to be patriarchal. It's um a, it's a big part of it that you can't just kind of like look the other way on. Something that Horsley says that I thought was really interesting was um w uh, Horsley gives some commentary about Jesus's uh, condemnation of divorce, which I think is a pretty uncomfortable thing to think about in 2024 because uh, personally I think I think it's a good thing that people get divorced <laughs> and people should if they if they need to. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for that. Um, but Horsley says that, uh, Jesus, like Jesus whole thing about divorce is not necessarily about like the morality of divorce itself or something, but it's because, um, uh, you know, a man could, uh, at the time, like divorce his wife and marry a, a different person, uh, to consolidate their land holdings and to like gain economic power in a particular region. So Horsley has these like I don't know that there's like a, there's a picture of Jesus as like somebody interested in the economic rights of the people of, of Judea, of Galilee. And there's a type of conservatism that you might find in it also, but it's like a very complicated and nuanced thing that has, is like, you know, entrenched in the particular political economy of that time. That is just like not easily universalized into some kind of like, Kantian ethics or something. It's, yeah. it's a lot more complicated than uh, than uh, Christians would want you to believe, I think. Right. Well, that I mean, the key is that it's not about kind of the abstract value of marriage or kind of the sanctity of marriage. Yeah. But it's about a whole contextual relationship in which marriage appeared in one way in the first century. And, you know, marriage appears in many different kinds of ways today that are basically different. <laughs> I mean, radically different totally. from yeah. that social situation. Yeah, I guess the interesting thing to me is that Jesus is responding to, like, the structural economic situation and not, mm -hmm. you know, individual moral moral rulings on something. I, I don't know. Pretty fascinating. Again, not something that you're going to hear at church very often. Um, so <laughs> a great reason to read or this Or ever, book. if you go to certain churches. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you might hear the opposite, in fact. Well, uh, to, to push this point further, that Jesus has an economic message, uh, Horsley, he spends a lot of time contextualizing and explaining the Sermon on the Mount. This, to me, was like maybe one of the high points of this particular chapter. There's a lot of other things going on in this chapter, too, that Horsley spends a lot of time parsing out, but the Sermon on the Mount was really cool. 
because you hear it so often. It, you, I think the Sermon on the Mount is cool for a lot of reasons. You hear it so often. Um, it's like one of those big prized moments in the gospel where you get some real clear answers on stuff. Um, but, uh, and, and even like leftists love to do it too, right? The Sermon on the Mount, Mount tells you all kinds of things about people who are wealthy and who are poor and what that means. Um, but here you, uh, you get some different insight into it, I think, than you would otherwise. So uh, the Sermon on the Mount, but before, before we get there, exactly, I guess, Horsley makes it clear that Jesus is like, again, this like m- this Moses type figure. He's, uh, he's saying the Sermon on the Mount as like a renewal of the Mosaic Covenant. Um, you know, he's not, uh, he's not here to overturn the law, but to fill it, all this kind of stuff. You, you know, it. you've heard those hits before. Um, <laughs> but Horsley says this in both Matthew and Luke, moreover, the narrative sets up the speeches as renewals of the Mosaic covenant, which in turn set up the rest of the gospel story and shorter speeches. <laughs> uh, thinking of Jesus giving speeches, uh, as the Sermon on the Mount is a funny <laughs> idea, <laughs> but, I, but fair, that's what he's doing. In Matthew, after Jesus proclaims the kingdom and heals all kinds of sicknesses and village assemblies, leading crowds to come to him from all areas of Israelite heritage, he went up on the mountain as had Moses, and he taught all of his disciples. Um, Horsley goes on to say this. In the covenantal renewal speeches parallel in Matthew and Luke, Jesus addresses directly the disintegration of village communities under the pressures of Roman imperial rule. The people were evidently blaming themselves for poverty and illnesses, while the blessings and curses were supposed to function as sanctions to motivate the people to obey the commandments. They had become an explanation of people's fortunes and misfortunes. Uh, This part here about um, (laughs) people blaming themselves for their, like, as as the source of their own problems is very interesting. Um, a, A lot of things are different. Uh, in in between between Bible times and now, but this is not one of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> First century yeah, neoliberalism, exactly, big time. Um, so then, uh, I I promise I'll make a point here in just a second. This is just getting up to it. So you have the Sermon <laughs> on the Mount. Um, that's like that's Jesus offering sort of a corrective to the way that people have been blaming themselves for for you know um, their misfortunes. Uh, But then Horsley says that Jesus illustrates this uh, further in the episode of Jesus healing the paralytic. Jesus's response dealt not with the paralysis, but with the person's assumption about its cause. In declaring that the paralyzed man's sins are forgiven, he addressed the debilitating collective self-blame, releasing healing powers that enable the man to take up his bed and walk. Um, so it's, it's a big deal because in that particular story, this is the one I mentioned earlier, but you've probably heard it in Sunday school. This is where, uh, Jesus is in one of those synagogues and one of those like gatherings in, uh, in, in one of these villages and like it's packed to the gills, everyone's inside. And then, um, then some guys, I guess the disciples, they do it. They cut a hole in the roof and lower a guy down <laughs> to Jesus and then he heals them. Um, and everyone's astounded, right? They're like, well, how, you know, how can Jesus do this? He's just like some guy, you know, um, this, this guy, he, he probably can't walk because his parents did something weird or he did something weird or he did something he, you know, he wasn't supposed to some kind of illicit affair, who knows what. Um, but in Jesus is like the, the way that Jesus sort of like heals the man kind of just like ignores all of that. Right. It's just saying like, none of that is real. Just, just get up and go away. <laughs> just get up and walk. Um, kind of an interesting moment, though, to to think about that, and in, in within like the the bigger the bigger scheme of like what's happening in the world, right? Not only is this like kind of healing a man, it's healing a community. It's like giving a it's giving a worker back to produce the subsistence that the community needs. So that's all very interesting, a very pro worker thing for Jesus to do. Um, thank you, <laughs> I guess, for that. Uh, but then it's also this other moment where it's like um, it's like overcoming the sort of like self blame, I guess, or self victimization uh, that this person is encountering for um, from suffering in the first place. So all kinds of interesting things kind of stacked on top of each other. Yeah, I mean, it's a important moment of like ideology critique as well, and all that, um, which yeah. is really neat. Uh, he also, uh, Horsley goes on to talk a little bit more too about Jesus intervening in that, uh, the way that the, the community understands themselves and also kind of helping them understand their own economic situation. Like I couldn't help but thinking of the episodes we did with, uh, the Herzog book, Parables of Subversive Speech, where there's this argument that through the parables, Jesus is trying to 
basically create an educational opportunity for people who are hearing the parables to come to understand the, you know, the economic um, exploitation that they're under, and then also figure out how to how to deal with it. Um, and Horsley does something similar, points out something similar. For example, he says, after declaring the new deliverance in process in the direct will of God, Jesus presents covenantal demands specifically aimed at overcoming the internal economic and social conflicts that were weakening village communities. Villagers would have been attempting to share their ever-shrinking resources, borrowing from and lending to one another according to the covenantal laws and customs of generous lending at no interest and periodically canceling debts. The economic pressures, however, were so heavy that the ability of the people to maintain their commitment to mutual aid had begun to break down. And then this is also where the loving your enemy bit comes in. Um, traditionally read as commandments about non about non retaliation, uh, however, this idea uh, in this idea, it's clear that Jesus is addressing economic and social conflicts in local village life. Lender families themselves, under pressure of the heavy tax burdens, would have been seeking repayment of the loans, but the debtor families would have been unable to pay, leading to local conflicts. Jesus addresses these conflicts with the general principle: love your enemies, do good, and lend. Um, I like this bit because, uh, first of all, it roots these, as we've been saying, kind of like platitude things that we get in Christianity where we reduce Jesus' sayings to these kind of like vague uh, pieces of wisdom, like love your enemies. It roots that kind of thing in a direct economic relationship, um, which is really great and helpful and interesting. Uh, also really interesting, too, because um, from the Herzog book that we read a while back, I think it was probably one of the biggest things for me in that text was understanding the uh the biggest like structure of debt exploitation that was in the in the neighborhood you know like these uh local rulers are slowly using debt to kind of take the land out from under peasants by not allowing them to pay but this idea that there are also these kind of intra-community debt problems creeping up as well and that Jesus is trying to uh, kind of help that community bind itself together and not get sucked into those debt-related conflicts was really an interesting piece of the puzzle, the economic puzzle too. So uh, a really neat way of reading the Sermon on the Mount, um, just trying to really parse out like what are the specific economic realities that Jesus is speaking into that we've kind of lost as we hyper-spiritualize uh, that particular sermon. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of hyper-spiritualizing, debts are something that we hyper-spiritualize, and we've talked about that a lot in this podcast, for sure. Uh, but there's even a bit in here that Horsley has about, um, a, a bit more about, like, becoming indebted to your neighbor. Horsley says, many villagers would have been indebted to their neighbors, perhaps partly because they had previously aided them with survival loans and have become economically vulnerable themselves. The command, if someone sues you for your cloak, let him take your shirt as well, addresses the desperate needy. The implication, of course, was that the debtor would be standing stark naked, embarrassing the neighbor in front of the whole village. And uh, Horsley mentions that this is like the uh, <laughs> a recognition of Jesus's humor. Um, <laughs> so anyways, there's something like really, really fascinating here, though, because even in like I in like leftist ways of reading Jesus, um, you get this uh, you get the sense that there's like this um, a radical giving uh, from Jesus, which I think that there is, right? But but there's something there's something like very solid in um, in the forgive forgiveness of debts because um, everyone is like basically a debtor at some point in this particular political economy. But there's also this other bit here that like <laughs> if you, if someone sues you for your cloak, let them take your shirt because that's going to make them look like an asshole. And I think that's also <laughs> very funny. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, you do get kind of the playful sense of Jesus in there as well. Uh, it's really fascinating. I mean, there's a lot more that we could say about Jesus's political economic program here in Horsley. But it's been, I think, a pretty fascinating way of just looking at uh, at that context, building it out a little bit further and trying to work out what is Jesus speaking into it. One of the biggest things that I found myself thinking about a lot is whenever we think about the kind of model of Christian economic community in Acts 2 and 4, the sort of proto-communist experience of uh, people sharing what they have together, um, one of the common kind of criticisms of that model uh, in the Marxist tradition is that it's a non-productive model. And I think there's a lot to that criticism. I think it is pretty spot on in a lot of ways. The idea being that if you are kind of, you know, evangelizing, bringing people into the commune, everybody sells their stuff, and then you kind of buy what you need to eat, at some point you're going to have to produce what you need to eat, and that becomes a big economic problem. 
But what uh, I like about how Horsley is talking about Jesus's vision here is there's also a lot of concentration on the productive side of the equation, that people are dropping out of production for a lot of reasons, or they can't produce for this reason or that reason. Their debt is uh, stopping their production from, uh, from happening in a subsistence way that's important for them and their community. And uh, there's this kind of emphasis on the, the productive piece that at least I would never have really been aware of reading the New Testament for sure. And I'm curious to see what he's going to say about Paul. I haven't read to the end of the book, so I don't have any good spoilers. Um, but uh, I wonder maybe if if there's an explanation for kind of where that productive piece goes or, or how it shows up differently in Paul or something like that. But uh, it was anyway, for me, I, I just found it really interesting to kind of think about that, you know, typical model of the communist community in Acts 2 and 4, and then this uh, other vision that Jesus is maybe calling our attention to that seems to have been maybe lost between then and, and Acts 2. Yeah, I think that the source of the book is so powerful because, I don't know, I grew up going to church all the time and never thinking twice about economics in, in a very serious way. And in fact, a lot of ways I think at church, people try to beat it out of you, not physically, or at least not in my case, <laughs> yikes. Um, but, uh, you know, they they tell you that it's not about that at all, right? It's not about the things of this world. It's about uh, it's about heavenly thoughts and salvation and all kinds of stuff. But it seems, I mean, you know, you read Horsley and you think about the context. And I think it makes a lot of sense that what Jesus is talking is about primarily about economics. So quite different. Um, well, maybe to round out this conversation, uh, we should we should turn back to a piece of the introduction. Um, Horsley has a section that says taking cues from biblical texts today that I thought was, you know, maybe worth talking about for a few minutes. He has a more sustained um, chapter on this at the end um, that we can talk about next time, hopefully. Uh, but for now, we should just maybe dip into it because <laughs> it would be dumb to talk about all of this economic stuff and not talk about maybe <laughs> what it might mean for us right now. So... Uh, from this really, from this section in the introduction, it's clear. Um, well, H Horsley thinks that there are some like pretty important takeaway points from for us today from from the Bible, which you'd hope um, you'd hope would be the case. Uh, Horsley says implicit in the covenantal criteria of economic justice. That's the the covenant of the Old Testament, but also what Jesus is like, kind of re renewing, reintroducing, giving some like new life to in the New Testament, is that people have a right to economic livelihood. That's like um, that's something that uh, Horsley thinks is not univocal in the Bible because there are places in the Bible where <laughs> it's more complicated than that. But um, it's an idea that you can definitely find in the Gospels. It's, you can definitely find it in a lot of the, um, the prophets of the Old Testament, that economic livelihood is a thing that people have some kind of general right to, that they have a right to subsistence. That's the thing that Jesus is like most interested in. Um, so anyways, a kind of interesting affirmation, um, maybe a little bit anachronistic in some ways too, but um, but one I'm willing to kind of like think about more. <laughs> yeah, uh, he goes on to say, uh, people have a collective responsibility to ensure that other members of the community have economic justice, which means a responsibility to cultivate the common good and aid the needy. Today, this require, would require an end to, or perhaps a rollback of privatization to restore the common good. Um, great <laughs> hot take from Richard Horsley here. Uh, but, uh, I have at least read the last chapter. I don't know why I do this with every book that I get. I always read the first chapter and the last chapter before any of the, the middle chapters. And, uh, the last chapter is great. A lot of good anti-imperialist stuff in there. But I think what I like about Horsley is that he does draw some, uh, connections that might seem anachronistic, but also I feel like are, are kind of well-earned. Like, He's trying to figure out what does the Bible mean for us today in a way that doesn't feel cheesy or too contrived. It's like if we sort of plotted out the trajectory of what's happening in with Jesus's intervention in this sort of plurality of voices, what would that how would that develop into today's capitalist uh, economy? And I think it's pretty compelling what he does. It's a, a good project. Um, I should also say the first chapter, which we didn't really talk about at all, is really good. It's just like about how we read the Bible and how the Bible is an economic kind of document um, and lots of good like intro to Bible study stuff in there. If you're looking for something with your um, to annoy the other folks in your particular Bible church group. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I, I think that all makes sense. I, I guess the other thing that I keep thinking about as I've been reading this, though, is that, like, um, well, so Jesus has this sort of insistence on taking, like, 
like uh, like economic justice for a community, right? Um, we want a common good for for people and end to priva- uh, privatization. That that all makes a lot of sense. Um, there's even some places in here where where uh, Horsley is is saying that like Jesus Jesus is talking about mutual aid, and I think that rules. Like that is totally cool. Mm-hmm. I guess the other part that um, we haven't talked about yet, and maybe we'll get to though, is that like the agrarian peasant communities that Jesus is visiting is not the community that we live in. <laughs> like if we were to transpose right. them or something, right? Uh, we are in the imperial core. So another thing to think about um, as we're reading the Bible, we're always like, I don't know, being being American, being in the global north, it always makes me feel kind of like um, at a little bit of an arm's an arm's length from from the gospel. This is this is like a, a message that's maybe not for me sometimes, and a yeah. hard idea to kind of grapple with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out with Paul next time. Maybe Paul will be easier. We'll see. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> if I <laughs> if I know anything about about Paul, I don't think so. But we'll find <laughs> out. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. At two bucks or more, you can get into our Discord where people are reading the Bible together. I'm extremely behind, but Matt's keeping up, which I'm impressed by, though not surprised. And uh, one of these days, I'll make it up to where everyone else is, but not for a long time. I'm adding like a chapter a day, and boy, it is slow going on my end. Uh, don't take two where weeks off. At? That's Currently. that's my biggest piece of advice. At this stage, I don't even know because I took a break this week. I feel so demoralized. I'm really behind, but. Just pray for me, I guess, is the key. Uh, maybe Easter will yeah. really put the the spirit back into me to get into it. You'll get there. Some of those chapters and books are real slog. They're really yeah. difficult. Numbers but... trip me up, especially. <laughs> yeah. Once you get to 1 Samuel, though, it gets a lot better. 1 Samuel's really fun. 2 Samuel's fun. Judges is sometimes fun, except when it's <laughs> genocidal and awful. So, anyways... It's been a trip, man. <laughs> um, I also want to flag, too, that there are some folks in our Discord right now who are organizing a reading group for Marika Rose's Theology of Failure. So if you if you want to read that book, jump down in and uh, get into it. So that's cool, too. Yeah, there's a lot going on in there. Grateful for that community. Um, let's see. Our music is by The Illogical Spoon and the outro is by... No, wait. I have that backwards. Our music's by Mario Armstrong yeah, and our right. outro is by The Illogical Spoon. And we'll see you next week. Church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up.